Welcome once again to The Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vretos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College and Yeshiva University here in New York. Civil rights lawyer and advocate Michelle Alexander concluded in her recent New York Times editorial that many of us today in the movements to end mass deportation and mass incarceration do not want to simply resist those systems. We aim to end them and reimagining the meaning of justice in America. As the saying goes, what you resist persists. Another world is possible, but we can't achieve it through resistance alone. Every week on The Radical Imagination, over the last three years, we've attempted to introduce you to some of the most committed, courageous, and creative individuals alive who are struggling and helping to bring about that morally transformative world a world of economic, political, and social justice, a new vision and narrative of what life can and should be, a world described by the prophetic witnesses of the Hebrew Scriptures as one of tikkun olam, healing, repairing, and transformation, a world that the philosopher and social activist Cornel West would say is one where justice is what love looks like in public, a world of radical love. Our guest today on the show has been on a prophetic, lifelong mission through his work as a psychiatrist, social activist, scholar, and author of several major works on violence that are designed to help create a nation and world struggling to be born. As he put it in the Tukun article we will discuss today, we believe that the most important and critical task facing us today is to learn how to understand the causes and prevention of violence. We as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of narrative, policies, and values toward each other. That centuries-long global struggle, yearning for human dignity and freedom, has been described in the words of Vincent Harding as like a river, sometimes powerful, tumultuous, and rolling, rolling with life, at other times meandering and turgid, covered with the ice and sorrow of seemingly endless winters, all too often streaked and running with blood. That rapidly swelling revolutionary river is surging today, and our guest embodies it in his We Shall Overcome Life Force Energy and Work, helping to create a new nation taking power and bringing a beloved community to the world. As Michelle Alexander puts it, the revolutionary river that brought us this far just might be the only thing that could possibly carry us to a place where we all belong. We're so thrilled and blessed to have James, James Gilligan on The Radical Imagination. He's a friend, he's a comrade. I respect him so much, I love him so much. Thank you, Jim, for being here on The Radical Imagination. And we want to talk about your work on violence. And we want to talk about uh, Tukun Magazine, the latest edition of Tukun Magazine, where we have an article, Violence, Morality, and Religion. We want to talk about that and some of the other work that you've been involved in. Um, so before we get into this article, tell me a little about what you've been trying to accomplish and think about these last few years. Well, actually, I... <laughs> I spent the last. Your whole life. Actually. I spent the last yeah, fifty years. Fifty years. Yeah. Um, but in particular. Yeah. You, trying to learn as much as I could about the causes of violence, the consequences of violence, and what we can do to prevent violence in America. I'm a psychiatrist. I went to medical school. I look at violence in America and throughout the world yeah. as a problem in public health. I mean, I know that the, these problems are usually thought of as moral or political problems. I approach them as a doctor. I see them as problems mm. in public health. I'm concerned to prevent epidemics of violence, which we call wars or genocide. Um, a religious terror. And religious terrorism, absolutely. Mm. Is, these are epidemics of violence. Right. Um, and uh, individual homicides or suicides are individual cases of violence. But um, they're all lethal. They all kill people. Right. And it's, it's lethal violence that I'm most concerned about because that is obviously the most serious form of violence. It's the one that's just totally 
you know, irreparable. So um, I've spent my life, in my professional life, investigating this problem and engaging in experiments to find out what we can do to prevent violence using prisons and jails right. as my, so to speak, uh, Laboratory. Social psychological laboratories, yeah, yeah, yeah. in which to to do this research, right? And what I've discovered is that we we can understand the causes of violence. We do know how to prevent violence. The only missing link here is the political will to do the things that we know will work, and the moral to prevent. Would violence. you add the moral will? Well, or how well, would you put I, it? I would say. So one, of the thing, one of the things that most yeah. surprised me, yeah. when I first started working uh, in the prisons, I gained the opportunity to run mental, the mental health programs for the Massachusetts prison system. Uh, first for the prison mental hospital, for the so-called criminally insane, the right. mentally ill who were violent, and then all the prisons, whether people were mentally ill or not. Before I started this work, I had been taught, and I believed, that the people in our society who commit violent crimes and wind up in prison do so because they never developed a moral value system, because uh, they were, you might say, amoral. Mm -hmm. I discovered the moment I started working with prisoners how wrong I was. I, nobody had understood this. I hadn't. I'd been misinformed. I had never seen a group of people who were more preoccupied with moral questions than the violent criminals in the hmm. prisons. They could talk about nothing else except the issue of justice and, and gaining justice for themselves. And doing it through these actions that were hurting yes. people. To it them, was justice for them. To them, their violent crimes were their way of attempting to achieve justice because they felt they had been victims of injustice. Uh -huh. And they, I'm not saying their way of thinking about this was the same of my, as exactly. mine, it was the opposite. But it would be a huge mistake to think that they weren't operating according to a perfectly coherent and well thought out moral value system. The only difference between the value system that I had incorporated in myself and theirs was my value system said, you know, in the words of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. Because if you kill, you're guilty of, of a sin against other people. But they uh, were arguing that in fact they should kill they, to they, attain justice that was not given to them. That's right. Because of past wrongs that they perceived had happened to them. That's right. And that goes across not just the individuals you were seeing in prison, but and, and we're just going to see a clip pretty soon on yeah. religious terrorism. And we, yeah. you then can expand what, what that is all involved yeah. to groups of people who are thinking the same. And, and the cycle goes on and on, and that's what we need to, to somehow understand and stop. Otherwise, yes. we're in Dr. Strangelove world yeah. here. That's right. Nuclear holocaust. That's right. What I discovered was the paradox that, you know, I had been raised to believe that the solution to the problem of violence in the world was morality and religion. What I discovered was this paradox that actually the main source of violence, the main uh, contributor and stimulant of violence, in world history has always been morality and religion. In other words... You, you got to repeat that for the audience here because that's, they're going to look at that cross-eyed here. The but. main stimulant of violence in the world is the quest for justice. Right. And the, the commandments of morality and religion. Um, Tell us to pursue that often violently? Yes, requiring yeah. violence. Requiring. As a way to achieve justice. Um, 
what I learned was it's not that the criminal, what, the group we call the criminals, right. it's not that they are immoral or irreligious, it's rather that they have a moral value system and a set of religious beliefs that simply happen to be the opposite of mine. Right. And I discovered this from working with them in, in the prisons and then subsequently working with groups like the World Health Organization and the World Court in the, in the Hague, mm -hmm. studying war crimes and crimes against humanity and, and so forth, genocide, right. ethnic cleansing, working with uh, um, the Office of the Secretary General of the United Nations right. and And very political presidents yeah. and yeah. prime ministers. Working and so on. with presidents and prime ministers, studying violence all over the world and discovering that the main cause of violence actually is morality and religion. Interesting. Let, let's take a brief look <clears throat> at a clip from CNN about religious terror and yeah. its spread all around the world. What's your name? She's It was two days of death and terror. Islamist militants brutally attacked Nairobi's Westgate shopping mall. Okay, you're safe. While explosions targeted two funerals in Iraq and a suicide bomber ripped through a church service in Pakistan. More than 250 killed in less than 48 hours, all in the name of religion. Religion actually gives you, first of all, the feeling that God is on your side. So it's not just you meeting out violence, you're doing it on behalf of God. Religious violence is on the rise. Just take a look at this map from the Pew Research Center. Countries in red and yellow have the highest incidence of sectarian violence. Note in particular, the Middle East and North Africa. The number of countries mired in sectarian strife has doubled in the last three years, but also Russia battling an Islamist insurgency in Chechnya and a surge in violence creeping across Asia, especially in Pakistan, with more religious violence than any other country. In fact, according to this report, about 75% of the world's population, more than 5 billion people, live in a country with high to very high incidence of religious violence. From the Crusades to Al-Qaeda, holy war has been waged across the centuries. But in the 20th century, secular political movements had kept a lid, sometimes brutally, on religious tensions. But now, with seismic shifts such as the Arab Spring, sectarian violence has flared again. In Iraq, for example, the centuries-old battle between the two rival sects of Islam, Sunni and Shia, has resumed, spilling over into neighboring Syria. And it's not limited to Muslim-majority countries. In Myanmar, the easing of military rule has resulted in militant Buddhists attacking and killing members of the Rohingya Muslim minority. Well, I think that um, wherever, wherever religion is bound up with national identity, then anybody who isn't of that religious group is exposed and could be expunged. A disturbing trend leading to fears we may see more horrific attacks like this. Atika Schubert, CNN, London. Wow, Jim, a lot going on there. And let me quote exactly from the article here. He wrote, Violence, morality, and religion. The moment, okay, so that is why we believe that the most important and critical task facing us today is to learn how to understand the causes and prevention of violence. The moment we attempt to do that, we are faced with a paradox. The main institutions we have invented in our endeavor to prevent or at least minimize human violence have been morality and religion. That is, moral and religious value judgments, commandments and belief systems. But the most deadly violence has always been committed in the name of morality and religion. And that's what that CNN clip showed. So, a lot there. That's why, in order to understand this paradox, yeah. I began to realize 
from my work with violent criminals in our prisons, that their moral value system was based on the belief that the, the worst uh, evil in the world uh, was shamed. Is to be shamed. Was to be shamed, be shamed and yeah. humiliated. Yeah, or disrespected. Uh, disrespected, insulted, right. ridiculed, rejected, treated as inferior, treated with contempt. Which that, they had been. Which they had been. Generally the, speaking. The most violent right. criminals had been subjected to degrees of shame and humiliation that had just been overwhelming to them. Right. Um, and they, they learned to think that that was the worst thing in the world, the greatest evil, and that the, the highest good in the world was the opposite of shame, namely pride. That is, self-respect, self-esteem, feelings of self-worth, and, and being respected by other people. Um, then I learned that the moral value system that I had been taught and had internalized was the opposite. I call this first value system, the one that the violent criminals believed in, I call it a shame ethic, because the point of it is how to avoid shame and replace it with pride. I realized I had been raised to believe in what I would call a guilt ethic, which is the opposite. Mm. In a guilt ethic, the worst uh, evil is to be guilty of a sin. This is from uh, your own religious From uh, my own religious background. background. I was raised as an Episcopalian. Episcopalian. And then exposed to uh, Roman Catholic teaching and, okay. and uh, also Jewish uh, so you, teaching. You got all three. Of which, oh, all, of which, three that. all of which are in agreement with each other uh -huh. on this, yeah. that the worst evil is sin. And um, in the, uh, the Christian uh, uh, gradation of the deadly sins, the deadliest of the seven deadly sins is pride. pride. Yeah. That's the worst evil in a yeah. guilt ethic, right. and it's the highest good in a shame ethic. The, in, a, in a guilt ethic, the worst evil is pride, and the highest good is the opposite of pride, namely humility. And self-effacement, self unselfishness, uh, self-sacrifice, and so forth. And uh, uh, to be altruistic rather than egoistic. Whereas in a shame ethic, the highest good is to be egoistic and prove that you're stronger and Macho. greater than anybody else. Right. Okay. So I learned that there isn't just one morality in the world, there are two, and they are opposites. But they are equally well thought out, they're equally coherent uh, as moral value systems and commandments. And uh, uh, there are religious um, supports for both. Even in the Judeo-Christian tradition, there is uh, a shame ethic, uh, but it eventually evolves into a guilt ethic as the religious consciousness um, uh, evolved over the centuries. For example, mm. um, the, uh, when, when I would talk with violent criminals in the prison, right. I would ask them why they had killed somebody or assaulted somebody or raped somebody. They, I would get the same answer in almost every time because he or she disrespected me. And they used that term disrespect so often that they abbreviated it into the slang term he or she dissed me. They openly, and, and it struck yeah, me that yeah. anybody who uses a word so often that they abbreviate Less it, it tells you something how about how central that is yeah, central. in their moral and emotion vo okay. emotional uh, vocabulary. So they very willingly e express this to you. Oh yeah. That was just you didn't have to sure. prod or any, okay. So this is and not they were only open to me. Book, like, yeah. Not only to me. I hear right. them talking about that to each other. Right. Right. Talk, right. You dissed Complain me. You, yeah, you dissed yeah, me. Right, you know. Right, I'm right. going to kill you. You. You right, know. Right, whatever. Right. Um, and that was be that would be the the motive and the justification. Uh, for murder or rape or other violent crime. This was an eye-opener for you to, to realize oh, yeah. this dynamics, yeah. yeah. Well, it was. On the other hand, I could certainly uh, correlate it with ex experiences I had growing up. I mean, I'd seen bullies in the schoolyard. Um, I'd seen my own father, who was very violent, and I would see him behave that way when I felt he felt he was being 
um, seen as inferior, and he could only prove his superiority by means of violence uh, uh, against other, other people. So I, I'd certainly learned some of this even before I started working uh, in the prisons. Right. Um, and you were there over two decades, right? Is that? Uh, or you, five were decades, there? Jim. Five decades. I started in 1967. In, in, the, in the Massachusetts prisons. In the Massachusetts okay. prisons. Then I've worked in prison systems. Right. All, all around this country and all around the world. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So make the connections for our audience to what we just saw here on the CNN clip the rise in yeah. religious violence all over. Well, remember, the main source of moral commandments has always been religions. Uh, in, in the Bible, we think of the Old Testament, which says, thou shalt not kill. And that's, to me, the, the essence of a, of a guilt ethic. But also in the Bible, you have a shame ethic where God commanded the Hebrews to commit genocide against neighboring tribes, to kill every man, woman, and child, and even all the cattle and livestock of, of the group, and mm, burn down mm. the, 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 you know, the, yeah. the cities. Yeah, yeah. Um, that God commanded violence. So, so that's also a part of our religious history. What I would say is that it, in the history of the Jewish people, they evolved culturally from a shame ethic into a guilt ethic. And uh, the same thing happened with the ancient Greeks who went from the ethic of the, uh, uh, of, of the Iliad where the highest good is to uh, uh, commit genocide against uh, a community that shamed you or humiliated you, mm -hmm. which they, the Greeks felt the Trojans had done. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, eventually though they reached, uh, they developed a guilt ethic as, as Hellenic society evolved, evolved over the centuries, exactly. uh -huh. and finally reached Socrates, who in, believed in a guilt ethic. He said it's better to be a victim of injustice than to be a perpetrator of it. Well, that's a guilt ethic. Uh, so this goes back and forth in yeah. various civilizations, the dialogue and... It does, but there is a developmental progression or regression. Okay. Yeah, and I'm tell saying us that, about that. Yeah. that a shame ethic is the more primitive, it's the first moral value system that okay. people believe, believe in. And eventually, once people realize that they're not impotent and inferior, and they begin to develop skills that they can feel proud of, they then realize the danger with that is that they can use their power and skills to hurt other people. So they also need to develop a, the, the emotional capacity to have feelings cool. of guilt about hurting other people. Okay. Um, now, what I'm saying, though, is I think we really want to solve the problem of violence in our society and throughout the world. We have to transcend morality. And that old-time religion here. Uh, yeah. In that and, sense. And the old-time religion. Right. I think we need to transcend morality by attaining the capacity for love. The that, beloved community that, that Michelle is talking about. The beloved, com the beloved community. Radical that, love. That every... Every, relig every major world religion has talked about, mm. but hasn't yet achieved. But I think we know how to achieve it. We know how, and, and the reason it hasn't been in the forefront and we seem to be regressing is... Well, everything, every human behavior is multi-determined. Exactly. So there are many, many causes of mm -hmm. what you are pointing to. Uh, and there will, there will have to be many uh, interventions in order to overcome these problems. But what I'm saying, what's important now is just to understand what we need to do in order to overcome them. And that's what I'm trying to bring to the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, I don't pretend I have a magic wand I can wave and make these things happen. Right, right. But I do think I can at least help, help us to understand what needs to be done and why we're in the mess we're in. Right. Uh, and what I would say is that uh, We need to transcend morality, not contradict it, but transcend it by developing the capacity for love of both of ourselves and of others so that we do not need moral commandments telling us that we should love ourselves or others. It will happen naturally with I, that absolutely. love. Absolutely. Yeah. If you have the capacity to love yourself and others, 
You don't need to be told to love yourself, which is the lesson of a shame ethic. Yeah. Because shame itself as an emotion consists of a deficiency of self-love. It's the opposite of pride. Pride is self-love. Right. Shame is the absence of self-love. So a shame ethic says, do what you need to be able to direct love toward yourself and esteem and power and good things and so forth. It motivates egoism, but it also motivates autonomy and independence and learning how to take care of yourself. It doesn't teach you how to take care of other people. That requires a guilt ethic, which says, and guilt is not, is, is not the absence of self-love, it's the presence of self-hate. When you, you feel you, guilty, you yeah. hate yourself and you say, I'm a wicked sinner, I deserve right. punishment. And, and, and acting on that toward others. Is that what you see? Well, as what, what that, guilt that? motivates is helping others and punishing yourself. So in other words, neither shame nor guilt solve the problem of violence. Shame motivates hurting other people to wipe out your, your own feelings of inferiority and impotence. Which would you say yeah. our president is operating under as well? Oh, Donald Trump is a perfect example of a, yeah. what I would call a, a shame-driven uh, uh, personality um, who is mostly concerned about not being laughed at and ridiculed and disrespected. And he's decided he can avoid that by means of aggression and violence, which he encourages his followers to engage in, you know, saying, you know, beat up people who protest at his rallies and uh, saying that Sitting he, in the military to stop yeah. uh, women and poor women and children coming to the borders, creating all that, sorts of that's fears right, that's right. in people that... Supporting that, capital punishment. Uh, the death. Uh, yeah. And it resonates with millions of people. Of course. Shame ethics always has. Shame cultures always have. But uh, what I'm saying is that that stimulates violence toward other people uh, and it stimulates defense of the self. Guilt ethics does the opposite. It stimulates violence toward the self in the form of penance and self-punishment, which can be, take the form of masochism or even of suicide, uh, whereas guilt is more, or shame is more likely to motivate homicide. Or Great Depression, yeah. also well. And you know, depression. Sure. Uh, guilt is a major emotion in depression. And you see it together, don't you, in so many cases with religious uh, fanatics, suicide bombers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Trying well, to kill that, others. The suicide bombers are, and, and are the different. recent events, of course. In, in the, the suicide yeah. bombers are like the people I saw in the prison. Really? Who had felt so desperate because huh. they had been treated, they felt, so abominably that it had, that basically what would happen is people in the prison, I, I saw thousands of them, would feel so abused and mistreated that they would keep fighting against the people who were abusing them, like the prison guards, and they'd get even more abused and more punished. Until finally, self-fulfilling prophecies. They were in yeah. a solitary confinement. Right. The, the lights were more. turned off. The door was closed. The mattress was taken mm. away. Mm. They were denied visits, phone calls. In other words, yeah. they were deprived of everything. They would be so angry, they wouldn't care if they themselves got killed. Really? They, yeah. When you opened the door, they would come out to fight against everybody, and they would tell me that they. They didn't care whether they themselves lived or died, as long as they could inflict as much violence as possible on the people they felt were tormenting them. And I saw, these weren't just words, I saw them actually behave that way. Yeah. They would provoke being killed by yeah. other people, either by other inmates or by the correction officers. And in the United States, on the streets of our cities, several hundred of people are killed every single year by doing that. They, are, they get in fights with police, and they'll do that until they get shot dead by the police. Mm -hmm. And they, they're doing that consciously. They know that's what's mm -hmm. gonna happen. And when it doesn't happen, they're surprised. Because right. that's what they wanted to have happen. In other words, I saw from our prisons the equivalent of suicide bombers. So when I started reading about suicide bombers in the newspapers, I thought, mm -hmm. I understand this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I've seen it already in the prisons. Now, you try to bring about dramatic radical transformations within the prison structure advocating an end or attempting to bring about an end to this cycle 
through what sort of... Uh, I'm not just advocating it. I actually negative. did it. You did it, right. We succeeded. And brought results, exactly. We succeeded in doing it. Um, first in the Massachusetts prisons. When I first started working there, they were like a war zone. There was a murder every month in the maximum security prison and a suicide every six weeks and, the, and riots and hostage taking throughout the entire prison system. By, in, by having a, introducing a comprehensive mental health program in the prisons, we were able to get the level of lethal violence down to zero throughout the entire prison system for up to a year at a time. And uh, we found programs that reduced recidiv the reoffending re rate to zero really? over a 25-year period. It was accomplished. When people, yeah. when people left, we were able to do that. In San Francisco, I, I led a uh, violence prevention experiment. We dropped the level of even non-lethal violence within the jail to zero for up to a year at a time. So it can be done. It can be. Again, we need that political will yeah. you were talking about. And we got the level of violent reoffending after people left this jail, and they were all violent offenders. We brought that down by 87% compared to a otherwise identical control group in another ordinary jail. So we know how to do this. Uh, I mean, this program... It could be done at a national level, too, to bring down the homicide. Absolutely. And, 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 and so-called wars on terror yep. could be, could be uh, dealt with in that way as well. That's right. To help bring about the sort of transformative yep. uh, love you're talking about. Yep. And the, the one way to do this is to enable people who are violent to have access to nonviolent means mm -hmm. of gaining self-esteem and feelings of self-worth such as education, education. employment, mm -hmm. you know, right. reasonable standard of living so they don't feel inferior to, to people who are richer than they are, and so forth. The, the, the secret is equality. The more social and economic equality we can create, the lower level of violence we will have in any society on Earth. And this has been shown throughout the world. Including the regions that we saw there on the clip, Middle East and yes. North Africa and, and parts of Russia and so on. Yeah. Because that, that, that's where the inequality also exists in yeah. uh, enormous, uh, at enormous levels. So it's, it's in the prisons, yeah. it's in our own country, sure. and yet, and it's around the world, and yet, again, um, the policies that were, we seem to be going in the opposite direction to greater economic inequality in, in, in the country and around the world here. Well, let me, are, let me are, describe this. Okay. The societies that have the lowest level, the lowest homicide levels on earth and in human history are the uh, social democratic countries, where they have kind of what you call democratic socialism in <clears throat> Northern Europe and Western Europe. Uh, in the Scandinavian countries, Germany, France, England, and so forth, their homicide rates are 10% to 20% of what ours are. Mm -hmm. In other words, we have five to 10 times as many murders mm -hmm. as those countries do. Uh, the same is true if you compare us with the other English-speaking democracies like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, our homicide rates are five times as high as theirs are in most years. I mean, this varies from year to year. But they're always higher in the U.S. There's never a year that we even come close to having murder levels as low as in those countries. Mm -hmm. And they have the greatest degree of economic and social equality. equality. They virtually eliminated what we would call poverty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in this country. The U.S., of all the economically developed countries on Earth, the U.S. has the highest degree of social and economic inequality, of but, income, of wealth, yeah. and we also have by far the highest rates of murder. And especially in those areas of the country, right, where there are these greatest, that, that, that has the greatest disparity. In fact, what's about. amazing to me, I, I, I was surprised to discover this, but it was true. The red states that, that have voted for Republicans in the last three presidential elections have been the states that have had the highest rates of homicide and also of suicide, the highest rates of imprisonment, the highest rates of capital punishment, the highest rates of gun ownership and of gun deaths from homicide, suicide, and accidents, yeah. and, and so forth. In other words, and the blue states the opposite, have the lowest rates of lethal violence, homicide and suicide, lowest rates of imprisonment, and, and 
lowest rates of capital punishment. In other words, the red yeah. states and the blue states are completely polarized. Right. Do you know how what the ratio is of capital punishment in the red states versus the blue states? It's 20 Plus. to 1. The red states execute 20 times more people than the blue states do. That's been true since capital punishment was first reintroduced into this country in 1976 after having been briefly uh, rendered unconstitutional. So, in other words, if you support violence, um, you can understand that it's the red states that have been uh, supporting violence and the blue states that have been preventing it. And, and setting the tone for that, and also uh, in different parts of the world, the Middle East, where yeah. many of the countries still do practice, Saudi Arabia, oh, yeah. especially, uh, the uh, death penalty and, yeah. and physical punishment and, and, sure. and so on. So we've got this uh, pull and tug going on here, and we are trying, I know you've been well over five decades, your whole life has been about promoting this sort of transformation, this moral transformation, policy transformation, uh, intellectual uh, transformation. So this article is an extremely, and I know the book that you're working on, is an extremely uh, important combination or attempt to articulate all of that. So yeah. what can you tell us to give us uh, hope here? In well, one sense? thing I'm trying to say is that I'm actually supporting religion as a positive, constructive force in human life. But I, I think we need to transform what we mean by religion if that's going to be true. And if religions are going to stop being the main causes of violence. Um, I think yeah. one of the main causes of violence today is what has been called apocalyptic fundamentalism. Um, the, uh, every major world religion, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, even the Japanese religions, every major world religion has developed a fundamentalist offshoot during the 20th century. It originated here in the United States. The word fundamentalism comes from a series of pamphlets that were published by Southern Baptist preachers in the American mm -hmm. South mm -hmm. and also in California called the fundamentals. It was the ideas of the fundamentals of religion. The problem is these fundamentalist religions actually stimulate violence rather than inhibiting it. And they have been responsible for violence wherever they are. In the United States, it's the right-wing fundamentalist uh, groups which uh, believe in a kind of simple-minded, dogmatic, uh, religious orientation um, who, according to all of our law enforcement agencies, are the main source of violence, of organized political violence in America today. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, immigrants, it's not terrorists, it's, it's these religious fundamentalists. The same thing That's happened in, in yeah. Israel. Meir Kahana was a, uh, a fundamentalist uh, rabbi who was thrown out of the uh, Israeli Knesset yeah. because he, he was fomenting violence and he stimulated a, a, you know, massacres of, of uh, Palestinian Arabs in, in, in Israel. Um, in uh, uh, Islam, of course, and we, we see that all over the Middle East now. Uh, and it's taken the form also of more secular nationalistic movements, authoritarian yeah. movements, uh, fascism and so yeah. on, and communism, yeah. also in the 20th century. And what, one thing that I think is really important to understand here um, is that since the scientific revolution of the 17th century, four centuries ago, and the European Enlightenment of the 18th century, um, the world has, the world religions have been under great stress. Um, they've been uh, subjected to a great deal of skepticism because science is based on skepticism. It's based mm -hmm. on doubt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, religion is based on faith. Certainty. And yeah, and science belief. is based on doubt. Science says doubt everything. Take nothing on faith. Question. Only believe those hypotheses that have been 
shown to be correct by means of empirical data. Well, that's Truth is created, never final. Yeah, that's created a great problem for religions. And one way that many countries have dealt with that is by developing what has been called political religions, starting with the creation of nationalism at the time of the French Revolution. What happened then was the revolutionaries threw the church out of the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, eliminated the Catholic religion there, but replaced it with the same kinds of ceremonies, sure. with choirs singing hymns, not to God and, and, and the church, but to the nation and the people. Yeah. And uh, sort of they, secular authoritarianism. So na the, the, the nation yeah. and, and the ideology yeah. called nationalism became. became the replacement for religion, but it became a political religion. Right. Then that evolved into imperialism, because if the religion is, if your nation is, is your God or your religion, then it must spread it. spread all over the world. Right. Conquer so that the created infidels. imperialism. Yeah. That imploded in World War I when the four greatest empires, or four of the greatest, got destroyed. And that left a vacuum that was replaced by totalitarianism, fascism, Nazism, Stalinism, and, and so forth. And then those finally collapsed. But they were political religions. With the historian on that CNN clip, Michael Burley, the English historian, has pointed out that Nazism was a political religion. Hitler was like the, the god or the pope or whatever you'd want to call him, uh, and so forth. But then all oh, that got defeated. The Nazis got defeated, and communism imploded finally in 1991. And that left a vacuum, which was replaced by apocalyptic yes. fundamentalism kind of religious which is now yeah. I, I call the nationalism and totalitarianism religions disguised as politics mm -hmm. I'd call apocalyptic fundamentalism politics disguised as religion because mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a political force the fundamentalists all want to take over yeah, the world that's it different group of actors are trying to accomplish yeah. the same thing yeah. so we need to transcend this to kun yeah. alum uh, yeah. And uh, go ahead. Yeah. And I just I think we need to understand these things first. Yeah, the dynamics. If we're, if we're going yeah. to be able to yeah. reduce the level of violence in our society, because let me make one thing clear: if the theory of evolution has shown anything, it has shown that almost every species becomes extinct sooner or later. Ninety-nine percent of the species that have existed in the course of evolution have gone extinct. And there's no, from the dinosaurs to the, our closest uh, relatives in, in the genus Homo, uh, the, the biological genus we belong to, our closest relatives, like the Neanderthals, they became extinct. There's no law in heaven saying that the human mm, species mm, mm. isn't going to go extinct. We could render ourselves extinct. We could become the first species in evolutionary history to render itself extinct. Oh, we saw that earlier. That, that was yeah. the opening clip with Dr. Strangelove there. Yeah. yeah. Yahoo and... Yeah. So I think there's nothing more important now than right. for us to understand the causes and prevention of violence. I think we know how to do it. The problem is that many people want violence because they think that's the only way they can build up their self-esteem and prove that they're more powerful than everybody else. So the nationalism that Trump is calling for is in fact what we need to also resist because it's, well, it's bringing a, back the same sort of mentality, appealing to the same sort of fears that in the past has only yeah. promoted and perpetuated more and more violence. Trump's rhetoric is a recipe for violence and it has succeeded to the extent that his followers have been engaging in murder of, of people. The Charlottesville murder where the you know, the uh, Trump supporter drove a, a car down. truck or a car Protest. into a crowd of pedestrians and killed somebody. And we had this recent uh, sending of uh, pipe bombs. You know, we had this guy in Pittsburgh who's really even more violent than Trump. His only objection to Trump is Trump wasn't violent enough. Well, Trump himself said his only objection to the followers of his who beat up people at, at the rallies and were then... Uh, convicted of assault and battery for that, 
Yeah. His only complaint about what they did was they hadn't yet been violent enough. So in other words, Trump is really supporting this escalation of violence, and he is succeeding. He's, he's getting uh, followers to, to become even more advocating for violence even than he has. What should be done with this neo-Nazi Pittsburgh? What would, he obviously needs to be restrained, Look, put away. Anytime but. somebody's going around murdering or raping other people, I totally agree. We have to protect the community by restraining them. That's not the same as punishing them. Right. It means restraining them, it means putting them behind a locked door away from the community so they cannot harm other people. And we need to keep them there until they have been able to demonstrate to us that they are not going to continue to be violent toward other people. Uh, so I'm not saying we should uh, unlock the prison doors and let everybody walk so. loose. I do think that the vast majority of people in prisons today don't need to be there. I think we have suffered from uh, a, a, an aberration called mass incarceration, mm -hmm. which only started in the mid-1970s. Right. We had a, a, a basically a, the same imprisonment rate throughout the first three quarters of the 20th century. And it wasn't until President Nixon declared his wars on crime and drugs, which was dog whistles for a war on blacks and the poor, that we, mm -hmm. that we created for the first time in our history something that we now call mass incarceration. So mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm saying That's most even, people yeah. don't belong in prison. On the other mm -hmm. hand, I have fought for years sometimes to keep some people in prison who I really thought were dangerous to the public. And I, so one, I'm, one I'm not saying we should let everybody walk loose. We've got to wrap this up, but I, I want to leave. What would you do as a psychiatrist uh, if you were the psychiatrist for this fellow in Pittsburgh? Well, the first thing I would do is abolish the whole prison system that we have nowadays. I would replace our prisons with locked, secure colleges and therapeutic communities where the people who entered them could get a full education, and uh, including college and maybe graduate school if they're able, uh, and also have access to every form of therapy they need. Psychotherapy, uh, treatment for substance abuse and addiction, um, also medical therapy when they need it. Uh, and that's certainly, unfortunately, we've, we're, we're really, we could go on and on. This you know, That will be the, the venue, that will be the, the, the way that we can begin to reach the, the true yeah. beloved community That's that we right. all need. Jim, thank you so much. It's a privilege and honor. I'm so grateful for you to, uh, that you've been here and come, and my dear friend, uh, take care, and we'll see you again next week. This is Jim Vretto's on The Radical Imagination. <laughs>